We're going to go back to our subject of the Holy Spirit today. Everybody say, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is so important. He is God who is in the earth. Can I tell you something? The Holy Spirit is here, and He's here right now. And He's closer than your breath. And if you're a believer, He's living on the inside of you. He's in you to give you life. He's with us to give us help. And He wants to come upon us to give us power. And the Holy Spirit is so important for living the Christian life. In fact, it's impossible without the Holy Spirit guiding us and leading us and helping us and speaking to us and empowering us. So we're going to begin to talk again about the Holy Spirit. I think this is number seven in our series. This is kind of a long series, but a lot has not been said about the Holy Spirit in some of our lives. A lot of us have not been taught about Him. And it's important for you to understand your relationship with Him. So we're going to talk about that today. I want to remind you also that as a church, we have a vision, a vision, a vision. A vision is what you see, see yourself doing for God. Everybody ought to have a personal vision. You ought to have a, a grasp on what you believe God wants you to do with your life. Who you're to be to your family, to your friends, your relationships. Everybody needs a personal vision. As a church, we have a vision. We've worked on our vision statement over the years, many years, and we've, re we've got it honed down to three words. And uh, I would like to know if anybody knows three words. What's the first word? Who can tell me? Love. Everybody say love. Second word is what? Victory. Everybody say victory. And the third word? Greatness. See, you could, have, you could have been up on that if you just read the little window as you came in the lobby. It's right out there in the lobby, right? Everybody say it again. Love, victory, greatness. That's our vision. You say, well, that, that, that doesn't sound like action. That just sounds like words. No, it is action. We are, God loves us, and we're supposed to love Him and love our neighbor. And that's what we're teaching people to do, to love God and love people. And victory is something that God wants you to have in your life. And we teach you how to have victory and success, spiritual success in your life. Jesus came and lived and died and rose again to give us victory. Can I have a better amen? Victory over sin, victory over the devil, victory in life. And then the third part of that is greatness because Jesus lives in you and his Holy Spirit lives in you and he's in you to share his greatness in you and through you. You can have the greatness of God shining through your life. Greatness is his inheritance for you. So it's love. We're living lives of love, victory, and greatness. And our vision is to get that imparted into you, but not only into you, but transmitted, communicated into the quarter of a million people that live in the Amarillo vicinity. We don't want to stop until we have shared with our entire community that God loves them, that Jesus will give them victory, and that they can share in the greatness of God. We want Amarillo to know that. Amen, somebody? And that's why we preach here every Sunday morning, on the weekends, four weekend services, Wednesday night. That's why we're on live stream right now. Oh, by the way, where's my live stream camera? Where's the camera? Which camera's on? Somebody tell me. Oh, that's there. Everybody look that way and give a hand clap to the live stream audience. People watching from all over the world. Hello, all over the world. Or in Canadian Texas, wherever you may be. All right. Somebody just told me this morning we had to miss last week because we, wasn't we weren't feeling well, but we watched the live stream and it was wonderful. It was great. Maybe you're visiting today from out of town. You can come visit us anytime on live stream. Now, this is not an excuse to stay home from church. Our live stream is not Bedside Baptist. It's just live stream victory when you can't get to the church house, okay? So, or when you're out of town on vacation. So, but, we, but we're reaching out. And, and I want to tell you this. This is July. I think I can tell you this. We're planning on, we're believing God, put it all together, to put our new, revised, revamped, renewed, improved television broadcast back on in Amarillo in January, first of the year. We want the whole city to know what God has told us to tell them. We want Amarillo to know that God loves them, that Jesus will give them victory, and that they can have His greatness in their life. Amen, somebody? So we're looking forward to that. We're excited about that. And I want you to tell them that at the workplace and in your classrooms and in your neighborhoods. Tell them, hey, God loves you. It doesn't matter what you've done. God still loves you. You can't get mean enough for God to quit loving you. God loves you. Jesus died to give you victory, and his greatness can be in your life. Now, that's awesome. That's an awesome vision, I, I think. It, 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 it's what wakes me up every morning, puts me to work. But that, what we're talking about, all of that 
being imparted into people's lives. It is impossible without the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. It takes God in the earth to manifest God's love. It takes God in the earth to impart the power of victory. It takes God in you to exert His greatness through you. The Holy Spirit of God is absolutely essential for these type of things to happen because it's supernatural. It's not natural. This is not a self-help group. This is the house of God where God meets with His people and changes our lives. Can I have an amen? Amen, somebody? Come on, give the Lord a praise. That, this is an interaction with God thing that we're, we've got going on. Now, I've got some indicators here that the Holy Spirit is among us. I just want to read you some testimonials. We've had two services in the last six weeks, one weekend, several services a weekend, and a Wednesday night where we ministered in healing and emphasized that God still heals sick people. And I, and, uh, I invite people to write me testimony cards, and they send them in, and I brought a few of them with me this morning. For instance, I've got one here from Anthony Graves. He, he wrote a note to me. He says, I, I had right rotator cuff surgery and have, have had minimal movement in my arm since that surgery. I've been doing physical therapy for two months. Well, I was in a healing service last week. And, and in that healing service, as I was prayed for, my arm started feeling normal with no pain, and I can now move my arm normally. Thank you for your prayers. Give the Lord a hand clap for that. Hey, God sped up his therapy. Hey, man, he's been doing therapy for two months, and then one, one day in the house of God, and he's got normal movement. Isn't that awesome? That's the Holy Spirit doing things like that. Cadron Varner said, on a Wednesday night, my mother and I were here. You were talking about healing. And we did a group prayer, and we laid hands on one another in the congregation. I was having a sharp pain in my side. As soon as we were finished praying, the pain was gone. I'm 14 years old. I recently came back to this church, and I'm glad that I did. All right. Give the Lord a hand clap for that for Cajun. Isn't that awesome? That's the Holy Spirit. Scott Simmons, last Sunday I went to the altar and my knee was completely healed. I can run again. Thank you, Jesus. You clap time, clap. That's the Holy Spirit doing things like that. Georgette Quincy, I've recently started coming back to church. I've enjoyed coming. Um, uh, in your prayer, I prayed for healing in my feet. And that is exactly what you said that someone needed. I'd I remember the Holy Spirit told me in that service, I think it was a Wednesday night, might have been a Sunday morning, that somebody was being healed in their feet. It turns out to be Georgette. She says, I, I, I heard you say that from the pulpit. Somebody needed healing. I feel healed, and I believe God has healed me. Thank you, Pastor David. Well, no, thank you, Holy Spirit, for healing her feet. <laughs> Lisa Blake. Where's Lisa? I thought I saw her a while ago. Where's Lisa? Huh? She went to the back. Where? Where? Where in the back? Is she in that class? I thought Lisa loved me. Lisa said, on Sunday, June the 7th, I'm just kidding around. Just, I saw how many people went out there. Let me tell you, that class is packed out this morning. I'm telling you, they can't hardly breathe in there. You've made a proper choice staying in here, I'm telling you. You can take it next time. All right. He, she says, on Sunday, June the 7th, as Pastor David was praying for all who were sick. I went down front to pray for a precious young mother who was diagnosed with cancer. As I prayed for healing for her, God's power was flowing and moving like I've never experienced. I felt a warm, tingling sensation and was healed myself while she prayed for the other young lady. I had been experiencing abdominal pain. I had a doctor appointment scheduled, a sonogram scheduled, but now I'm healed. I canceled my appointment. I have no pain. The Lord healed her while she was praying for someone else. That's the Holy Spirit. I just I act like I just got all the time in the world this morning, don't I? The Holy Spirit is wonderful. He changes lives. He heals bodies. He comes close to us and speaks, whispers. God's love into our ears and our hearts. We simply cannot make it without the Holy Spirit. He loves you. He loves people. 
He's here on a mission. And that's what I'm going to talk about this morning, the Holy Spirit's mission in the earth. Uh, I, I do sense Him leading me to pray for you, though. I, I've been reading these healing testimonies. Some of, many of them are about pain. If you're experiencing pain in your body, would you stand? I'd like to pray for you before I teach this morning. Anyone and everyone with any kind of pain in your body, would you just stand up? Just stand up and receive a prayer. Just stand up, if you would, everywhere, anywhere, all over the building, up in the balcony. And now, nobody has to get up and move out of their chairs, but if you're close by, just reach over and lay your hand on their shoulder, their elbow, just touch them for a moment. We're the body of Christ. How many of the Holy Spirit lives in us? Amen. Whether somebody's touching you or not, the Holy Spirit is here. Let's just bow our heads and let's just be open to the Holy Spirit. Father, in the mighty, mighty name of Jesus, I ask that your Holy Spirit flow into these bodies, that your power, Holy Spirit, be imparted. Healing virtue, the healing ministry of the Holy Spirit of God. I pray that you will flow through believers' hands, you'll flow through the air, you'll flow through my words, but like a river of life, you'll flow into their bodies, driving pain out. I come against pain, infirmity, I command it, leave their body now in the mighty, mighty name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the risen Savior of the world. I say that you are healed in his name. Amen and amen. Let's get this. Remain standing, but let's all give God some praise. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I want you to move. Just move your body a little bit. Don't sit down yet. Just move your, everybody got prayed for, move your body. Work your arms, your legs, your neck, your back, whatever was ailing. Could, could you use that part of your body if it's possible at all? If it was your stomach, pound on that stomach. Come on. Come on. Act in faith. Do something. Walk on your legs. Stomp on your knee. Do something. You know, work your hands. Do something like that. Jesus often told people to move and act in faith. You know? Now I want you to think about your body and about the pain. And if it lit, left, if the pain disappeared, would you put your hand up straight up in the air? I want to see how many people just got healed. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, 12, 13, 14, well, at least 15 people. Somebody needs to go home this afternoon to your neighborhood and say, God healed about 15 people in our church this morning. When they look shocked, say, oh yeah, it happens all the time. Holy Spirit's there. Come on, give God praise. Yeah? Come on, let's give God some praise. Come on, stand up, everybody. Let's stand up. Come on, we are not in such a hurry that we cannot give God His due worship and thanksgiving and praise this morning. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We praise and magnify your name. Come on, come on, shout out to God. Give Him some verbal praise this morning. Come on, thank God. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. We worship and magnify you. We give you thanks. I pray over this word that I have this morning, this word from you. I pray, Lord God, that you'll mix it with your love and your compassion and with your power and that it would be a transforming word, a word in due season that maketh the heart glad. Like, like apples of gold and pictures of silver fitly spoken for our situation in life. Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus, speak to our hearts by the Holy Spirit of God. In Jesus' name, and everybody said... Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Look with me in John the 16th chapter, if you would. John 16. I want to talk about the Holy Spirit's mission. Jesus actually told us about the coming of the Holy Spirit into the earth, and He is here. He came 2,000 years ago. He does not ebb and flow and come and go, but He came to abide with us forever. He will manifest himself in different ways at different times in different situations, but he's always here. Everybody say, he's here. Look at your neighbor and say, he's here. Now, some people are afraid of the Holy Spirit. They, they get squeamish about the Holy Spirit. They, they're comfortable talking about Jesus, you know, as long as Jesus doesn't come to, too close. But he does come close, and he comes by his Holy Spirit, and he's closer than your breath. And I'm telling you, he knows where you are this morning. He has targeted you. He is aiming at you through my words. He's talking to you today, the Holy Spirit of the living God. He loves you. He cares about you, and he's here on a mission. The Holy Spirit is in the earth on a mission. 
Wonder what it is. Jesus told us what it would be. Watch this. Listen to what Jesus says. John 16, beginning with verse 7. Jesus says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you, or rather uh, advantageous for you. It's good for you. It's necessary for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. That's the Comforter, the Holy Spirit. And when he has come, he will. He's going to tell us what he's going to do when he comes. So in other words, Jesus is telling us what the mission of the Holy Spirit would be. He's going to tell us what the Holy Spirit is here to do, specifically. This is intriguing to me. And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin, because they believe not on me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father and you see me no more. Of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. Oh, I'm telling you, Jesus said a mouthful in that one statement, in that one passage. He's telling us about the mission of the Holy Spirit of God. Now, I want to define an old English word there, that word reprove. I want you to understand the word reprove. Look at it again in, the, in verse 8. Jesus says, and when the Holy Spirit has come, he will reprove, reprove. The word reprove means to convict, convince, expose, bring to light, or reveal. And the Amplified Bible says that it means to bring a demonstration. I believe the Holy Spirit is in the earth to demonstrate God. I believe the Holy Spirit is in the earth to convict us of our sins, to convince us of the truth, to expose and bring to light the reality of God. The Holy Spirit is here because He brings a manifestation of God to the earth in all of His outward attributes and characteristics and ministry flows. The Holy Spirit is here to transmit God into people's lives. Thank God He sent His Spirit. When Jesus went back to heaven, we were not left without God. God is here. Give the Lord a hand clap. He's here. And He's here on a mission. Now it basically says three things. Three things that the Holy Spirit came to do. Number one, number two, number three. If you're taking notes, write these down. We want to help you to understand the basic ministry and mission of the Holy Spirit. Number one, He came to convict the world's sin. That's His number one mission, to convict the world's sin. Uh, I don't know if you know this or not, but sin is the issue. If you're going to read the Bible, you're going to have to deal with sin. Sin is the problem. Sin is what Jesus came to save us from. Sin is what He came to eradicate. Sin is what Jesus came to conquer. Sin is your worst problem. Sin is destructive. Sin is a destroyer. Sin uh, uh, kills us. Sin brings forth death. The soul that sins shall die. Sin is a plague. Sin is a disease of the Spirit. Sin is our undoing. Sin is earth's problem. And Jesus came to cleanse us us from our sin, to set us free from our sin, to forgive us of our sin, to help us to overcome our sin, to conquer sin in our lives, to redeem us from sin, to help us to live in a lifestyle where we can avoid sin. Sin is your enemy. It is not your friend. We need to capture this mentality of God that sin is against us. Sin is against you. Sin is not a nice friend for a weekend evening. No, sin is destructive. Sin is an unpopular word. Some of you are already squirming because I used the word sin about 28 times there. Because we don't want to hear about sin. In our culture today, nobody wants to hear about sin. Nobody wants to be reminded of their sin. In fact, sin is a, is a politically incorrect word. We don't have sins anymore. We have problems and errors and mistakes. But, but the Bible still says we have sin. And God's Word is eternal. And Jesus said Himself, the Scripture cannot be broken. It is without error. God says our problem is not our mistakes. It's not our errors. 
It's not our ignorance, although that is a problem, but our major problem is sin. Sin is what has darkened the mind. Sin is what has made us weak. Sin has produced a web of weakness that's fallen upon us and kept us restrained and enslaved and in bondage to where we can't be the people that God really created us to be. Sin is a plague on the human race. Sin takes people into destruction for eternity. Sin is your enemy. It is no friend. It's like a snake. You know, I never met a snake that I didn't hate. I believe God made snakes just to give us something to kill. <laughs> I don't like snakes. I moved out in the country here recently, found out lots of snakes out there. One of my neighbors has killed five rattlesnakes in about six weeks. I promptly went to the sporting goods store and bought me and Carrie a pair of snake boots. Snake proof boots. No snake's going to bite me on the ankle. No, no. You say, oh, haven't you got any faith? Yeah, I got faith and I got boots. I, I'm, 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 I'm ready. I don't like snakes. I don't like bull snakes, green snakes, rattlesnakes. I don't kind of like no kind of snake. I don't like snakes. Snakes are a symbol of the devil, and the devil's a symbol of a snake, and I hate the devil, and I hate snakes. And I'm off my subject, but you get the picture. I'm not going to put up with a snake. Are you kidding me? But Christians, we put up with sin. You know, some people like snakes. Some people like sin. Some people pet their snakes, and some people pet their sins. But if your sin, let me say it this way, if your snake happens to be poisonous, you better watch that snake because he is equipped for one thing, killing. And your sin is equipped for one thing. It's equipped to kill you. And that's its design. And that's its focus. And that's its purpose. And that's why it was unleashed in the human race by the devil because he wants to efface the image of God from the human race. He wants to kill you. The thief comes not, Jesus said, but for to steal, to kill, and to destroy you. And the weapon he uses is sin and the products of sin. And everything that sin has produced in this human race, sin is the issue. Sin still has to be talked about. Sin is something that has to be dealt with in the house of God. And the Bible says it's the first mission of the Holy Spirit to come and to convict, not to condemn, not to whip, not to guilt trip, but to convict. Condemnation is kind of general. You're just an all-around bad person. That's condemnation. That's not what the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit says, I love you. God loves you. I've come to help you. And then he pinpoints exactly, specifically, exactly what you're doing wrong. That's conviction. And conviction is a good thing because if you don't have conviction, you won't know you have sin. And if you don't know you have sin, you don't know you need a Savior. And unless you know you need a Savior, you'll never call on the name of the Lord and be saved. That's why Jesus said the Holy Spirit has come to convict the world of sin because they believe not on me. He said, they've got to come to a faith in me, but you won't come to faith in Jesus until you know you need Jesus. And you won't know you need Jesus until you realize you've got sin. And you won't know you've got sin until the Holy Spirit convicts you of sin. And the Holy Spirit generally convicts us of sin through our reading of the Scriptures, which is why some people don't read the Bible much, or a preacher, and that's why some people don't go to church much, but you do, and so here I am, and here you are, and so here we go. Are you ready? It's my job to tell you what sin is. I won't turn to every scripture, but may I give you a list? It's just, you know, off the top of my head list. It's just kind of a short list, 20 or 30 things. Adultery is sin. It's sinful and it's wrong. Lust is sinful and wrong. Fornication, sex outside of marriage is sinful and wrong. Homosexuality is sinful and it's wrong. Lesbianism is sinful and it's wrong. Pornography is sinful and it's wrong. Whether you're looking at it, producing it, or taking a selfie of yourself in the bathroom and sending it to your boyfriend, if it's pornography, it's sinful and it's wrong. Everybody take a deep breath. If I don't tell you this, nobody else will. If the church doesn't tell you this, nobody else will. Nobody else is battling sin. The Congress isn't. The schools are not. Your neighbors are not. Why else should we be in the house of God than to hear what the Holy Spirit is doing in the earth? He has come to conquer sin, the sin that can kill you, the sin that can be your undoing, the sin that can sabotage your next generation, that can confuse people into thinking up is down and black is white and right is wrong. 
we need a clear definition of sin. Sin is anything against the will of God. Sin is anything against the Word of God. Drunkenness is a sin. Smoking weed and getting high is a sin. Taking your prescription meds and taking them just to get high to escape the world, even if you got a doctor's prescription, is still a sin. It's still bending your mind. It's still just getting drunk, but you think you're legal, but you're not. You can live in Colorado. It's still wrong to smoke dope. Lying is sinful and wrong. Cheating is sinful and wrong. Stealing time from your employer is sinful and wrong. Gossiping about your neighbor is sinful and wrong. Racism is sinful and wrong. Let's call that what it is. Hatred. White on black hatred. Black on white hatred. Mexican on white and black hatred. Just everybody hating anybody for whatever reason. Hatred. Hatred is wrong. It's sinful. It's the devil's attack upon the human race for us to destroy ourselves among ourselves. And as Christians and as believers, we must change our thinking. We must change our attitudes. We must decide to be people of love and people of forgiveness. And we need to understand that we... I'll tell you something else that's wrong. The Jews used to always, they would constantly turn from the living God, Jehovah, and start bowing down to the idols of their neighbors, the pagans, Dagon's idol, and ba uh, 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 Baal's idol, and all of these idols. And remember Solomon married all those, who had 300 wives and 700 concubines. And he pulled pull them all in the palace and let them bring their gods and he backslid away from God and began to worship idols with all of those women. And it was un his undoing. That's the way the Jews did it. It was the history of the Jews. They were always leaving the living God and the living Word of God and bowing down to idols. And that's what we're doing in the church when we bow down to the idol of political correctness and bow down to the idol of what the world thinks a Christian. Since when does the world get to define what a Christian is? The world's trying to back us into a corner and saying, Christians, you need to be nice and you need to stop talking to us and you need to keep your convictions in your church houses. No, we're to be witnesses of the truth, setting the captives free by preaching the truth in the love of God, but in the power of the Holy Spirit of God. Don't mix your religion and politics. Oh yeah, we're going to mix our religion with everything. Religion, our religion, our faith, our relationship with God is supposed to take over our lives. Uh, I read the statistics in the 20s and 30s group, age group amongst Christian followers. The largest percentage of young Christians are Christians in worship, Christians on Sunday, Christians in most of their lives, but atheists with their sex life. They're still having sex. They're still spending the night with each other. They're still cohabitating. Folks, let me tell you something. Sexual sin is sinful and wrong. I said it last week. I'm going to say it again. If you're living together and you're not married, you need to either move out or move up and get married and make it legal. Make it holy. Make it matrimony. Don't make it, you say, well, we love each other. What's love got to do with it? Just because you have an emotion, emotions come and go. God stands forever. His truth stands forever. Get married. Get married. It's easy. 70 bucks. Your mother will give you the 70 bucks. I, I'd be willing to bet that. For the license. It's just, just. I should have just spent the whole first Sunday on this one deal here, I, but I got to move on. You say, I don't like the way I feel. Oh, you never felt conviction before. The Holy Spirit's number one mission in the earth is to show you and I what we're doing wrong. Why? So he can clean it up for us. He wants to clean us up. People, Christians, have fallen into this idea that Christianity, that faith, is just about we're forgiven. We're forgiven. We just keep on doing the same stuff. No, 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 no. Jesus didn't come just to forgive you. Christianity is more, more than praying a prayer, singing some songs, and getting some new friends. Christianity is the reformation of the, Christian, of, of, the, of the human character. It's the transformation of the human soul. It is the supernatural. Are you listening? Supernatural. Interaction of a holy, loving, powerful God in a person's life, changing them, transforming them, recreating them. God 
wants to rework your life and give you a life that is in his image, that's pleasing to him. He no longer wants us to live. His faith. People say, well, you know, uh, all have sinned, so what's your sin, preacher? We're not talking about my sin today. We're talking about yours, praise the Lord. Amen. <laughs> Come on, somebody. I'm just joking around. But I'm talking about all of our sin. Okay, but listen, people want to say, well, all of sin, all of sin. Well, that, that, that's the record of past wrong, not present practice. Come on, read it carefully. The Bible didn't say all are sinning and falling short of the glory of it. It said all have sin. We've all made mistakes. We've all committed sins. We've all been mean and we've all been wicked. But that doesn't mean we're allowed to wallow in it from this point forward. God wants to clean up our lives. God wants to sanctify your life. God wants to set us apart from sin. God wants to save us. Save means save. In the boat, out of the water, stop drowning. Get back to land, eat again, live again. Spend eternity with him again. Come on, he wants to cure us. We've not been given a license to sin. God didn't just forgive you past, present, future. Now just live like the devil if you want. I'm sorry, I'm passionate about this today. I'm tired of the world beating us up and us being so ignorant that we let them. Wrong is wrong and right is right. Sin is sin and it's to be avoided. 1 John 1, 2, John wrote, the, 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 Little children, I write unto you these things, that you sin not. And if, not when, if a man sin, thank God we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He'll forgive us and he'll cleanse us again. Thank God we've all had to use that. But notice what he said, sin not. And if you sin, not sin not. And when you sin, God does not expect you to sin. God expects you to move toward him. And let's conquer it and let's learn to live right. Come on, somebody, let's learn to live right. So who are you mad at? I'm not mad at nobody but the devil. You know, the snake. I hate snakes. And the devil is a snake. I'm not mad, and I'm mad at you. I'm, no, you're the one that got snake bit. I'm trying to get you to the hospital. Welcome to the hospital. <laughs> Number two. The Holy Spirit's mission is to reveal righteousness. Jesus said something very interesting here. He said, the Holy Spirit's coming to bring a revelation of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more. What did, the, what did he mean by that? Well, when Jesus was here on the earth, they could see Jesus. And so they understood what righteousness is because they could see it in him. Because he lived right. Right? He spoke right. He behaved right. He preached right and taught right and believed right and did right. He fulfilled right. He followed his Father and the Holy Spirit right. Jesus was the perfect example and revelation of righteousness. What's right? What's it mean to do right, say right, behave right, speak right, have a right attitude, have a right mentality? Just look at Jesus. But Jesus said, okay, you've been looking at me. And you've got a revelation of righteousness, but I'm going back to heaven, and you won't be able to see me. We can't see him. We can read about him, but we can't see him. But he says the Holy Spirit's going to come so that you can again see righteousness. He's going to bring a revelation of righteousness. For instance, when we're, in the, when we're in the scriptures here in the house of God, and I'm reading the scriptures, and you have that aha moment where the light comes on on the inside, and you understand something all of a sudden, that wasn't a smart preacher convincing you. That was the power of the Holy Spirit. Spirit revealing to you a truth that makes you free. It's an operation of the Holy Spirit of God revealing what's right to you. Revealing righteousness. I'll tell you something else. Every time a husband says no to an immoral woman and won't go out on his wife and cheat on her, that's revealing of righteousness to the world. They need to see somebody living right. When you refuse to lie, that's a revelation of righteousness to the world. When you stand up and keep your word and pay your bills, that's a revelation of righteousness to the world. I'm telling you, the Holy Spirit lives in the church, and the church is to be a revelation of righteousness. The world ought to be looking at us to find out what is right, what does right look like, what is right thinking, what is right teaching, what is right doctrine, and what is right behavior. They're looking to us. They're looking at you. They're looking at me. Let's give them a revelation of righteousness. Let's let the Holy Spirit lead 
in God our lives, and he can bring a revelation of righteousness to the world. Amen? We've got a young man in this church by the name of Baldo. He's been coming for a few years, got saved a few years ago. He has a history like you and me. We've all got a sinful history. He's got one too. But man, he's been seeking God, and he's been letting the Holy Spirit take control of his life. I'm so proud of Baldo. He's, is he in this service anyway? I think he was there last night, but he's probably working in it. Oh, Baldo, there you are. Come here, come here, come here, come here, come here. Come on, come on, come on. You got a beautiful blue shirt on. Stand right there. Wave at him, Baldo. Here's Baldo right here. Here's Baldo right here. And so he lived over here in an apartment complex. And one, and one time, this young lady that lived in the apartment complex, she said, I've been seeing you around. And she let him know she thought he was cute. And she wanted to kind of meet up with him. And she kind of let him know in no uncertain terms what the evening would uh, consist of if they got together, if you know what I mean. <laughs> you know what Baldo said? He said, well, if you want to be with me, then meet me at Victory Church on Sunday morning at 11 o'clock. <laughs> oh, a revelation of righteousness. Take that devil. Come, somebody kill a snake, somebody. I'm not talking about the woman, I'm talking about the demon that drove her trying to take a holy man of God down. Well, this world needs a revelation of righteousness, and the Holy Spirit came to give them one. And he wants to do it through you and through me. Quickly, number three. Number three. The Holy Spirit came to demonstrate Satan's defeat. Pastor David, where did you get that? Look at, look at verse 11. He's come to reprove the world of, ju of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. The prince of this world. Back up to chapter 12. Chapter 12. This is just before Jesus goes to the cross. He refers to it. Chapter 12, verse 31. Watch this very quickly. I'm almost through. Jesus said, now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of the world, that's the devil, the ruler of this world, be cast out. Now. He said, now is the judgment of the world. Now the devil is going to be cast out. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. This he said, signifying what death he should or would die. So he's talking about his death. He's talking about being lifted up on the cross. And he said, I'm fixing to go to, I'm, I'm about to go to the cross. And right now, this is what's going to happen. The world is going to be judged and the devil is going to be cast out. What did he mean by that? The world judged. Well, that's where the world was judged. That's where all of the world's sins, it fell upon Jesus. He became a substitute and a savior for the entire world. God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that whoever in that whole world would believe on him would not perish but be saved. Thank God. He died for the world. He was a substitute for the world. He took the judgment of the whole world. The world has already been judged. If people go into judgment, it's only because they refused their Savior and the judgment He bore for them. Because He has already taken all the punishment and all the penalty and all of the death and all of the abuse and all of the pain and all of the... He has paid the entire payment for the sins of the whole human race. Thank God. The world has been judged in Christ Jesus. That's why God now has grace for the world and He'll wipe all your sins away because all of His judgment fell upon Jesus and we get off scot-free if we'll simply believe in Him. Amen? But he said something else happened at the cross. Not only was the world judged, but Satan was going to be cast out. That word cast out means expelled, driven out, or deprived of the power and influence he exercises. Deprived of the power and influence he exercises. You say, Pastor David, he is still, he is still influencing and exercising his power. Look at the world. I know, it's crazy, isn't it? The devil is still out there, and he's still powerful. We say, how can we say the devil's cast out and expelled and deprived of his power? He has been cast out, and he has been expelled, and he's been deprived of his power over a certain specific group of people called believers. You. Because that's the ones that have responded to this penalty and death and judgment that Jesus endured. Jesus died for the whole world, but the only ones that will be saved are those that repent of their sins and believe in Him. Jesus has cast the devil away from all of the world, but the only ones that will be able to escape the power of the devil are those who believe in what Jesus did on the cross. What did He do? Hebrews chapter 1. 
or, or chapter 2 rather, says that just like you and I have flesh and blood, he took part of the same so that in his flesh and blood he could go to the cross and die a death. And through his death, the Bible says, he delivered us from the power of death and he broke the devil's power. He destroyed it, says in the King James. It means he rendered the devil powerless. He broke his back, he pulled his teeth and he removed his power from those who believe in Jesus. In Colossians 1 and verse 13, the Bible says to Christians alone, Christians specifically, you have been delivered from the power of darkness. In Luke 10 and 19, Jesus said to his followers specifically, behold I give you power to tread on pawns, serpents, and scorpions. Oh, I give you power over the snakes and the scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. We've got to realize something. Something happened at the cross. The devil is not what he used to be. He no longer has power over you. He cannot dictate to you who you are. He cannot make you do what he wants you to do. He cannot bind you to sin. He cannot leave you untouched. He cannot make you like the world wants you to be. He cannot exercise his slavery or bondage over over your life you've been made free and whom the Son sets free is free indeed and the Holy Spirit's mission is to come and to manifest through our lives a demonstration of Satan's defeat he he is not what he used to be he de- cannot overlord over a life of a believer who is in Christ Jesus and connected with God in heaven are you listening to me and so now every time that husband says no to that immoral woman and that temptress He's demonstrating the Satan's defeat. And every time you say, no, I will not lie about my coworker to get ahead, you're demonstrating Satan's defeat. And every time the Holy Spirit reveals a word of knowledge and someone gets healed, we're demonstrating Satan's defeat. And every time we have a Sunday morning service and 15 people get saved right in front of everybody, or are healed, I should say, then we're demonstrating Satan's defeat. Can I tell you something? Satan is defeated. He has no hold on you. Wake up, learn it, figure it out. The devil cannot hold you. Jesus has made sure that he's deprived of his power and influence that he can exercise over you and all he has is lies. The liar that you were born that way. Well, even if you were, you don't have to stay that way. We can demonstrate Satan's defeat. The lie. That it's okay if you're in love. No, let's demonstrate Satan's defeat. The lie that you can play with fire and not get burned. No, let's demonstrate Satan's defeat. The lie that you can pet a snake and not be bitten. Oh, no, let's demonstrate Satan's defeat. The Holy Spirit has come to help us, to convict us of sin, to reveal God's rightness, and to demonstrate Satan's defeat in our lives. We are not what we used to be either. We were sinners, but now we're saints. We used to be adulterers, but now we're free. Some of us used to be homosexuals and lesbians, but now we're straight. Let me tell you, I'm not talking about some natural self-help thing. I'm talking about a supernatural, miracle-working God that can transform lives into the lives he, He always intended them to be. Do not believe the lies of the world. Do not believe the lies of the devil. Do not believe the lies of the news media and the doctors and the science. They're going against the scripture and the scripture cannot be broken. It is the word of God. Come on somebody, let's draw the line in the sand. Let's all stand up, give the Lord a hand. I gotta quit, come on, come on. You gotta let me quit, come on. Give the Lord a hand clap, give the Lord a hand clap. Oh, my God. We need to get done. We need to be done with boring beige religion and get us a heavy dose of Holy Spirit empowered faith in Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. Would you bow your heads? Close your eyes. I want you to know I love you. I'm yelling not at you. I'm just yelling because I'm passionate. We got to kill some snakes. Snakes that are biting you. Snakes that are pursuing you. Snakes of sin and temptation and demonic spirits that are wanting to deceive you and delude you. The Bible says judgment must begin in the house of God. We have to get saved first. We have to exercise authority over the devil and demonstrate his defeat first. Yeah. So I want to invite you 
because God's Holy Spirit is dealing with you. Some of you right now, there's conviction in your life just from one or two little things that I've said. And I, and I want you to know that is a gift. That's not somebody downgrading you or condemning you. That's a gift from the Holy Spirit specifying here, here's where the enemy has slipped in. He's trying to destroy your life. Let's expel him together. Let's rid him from our lives. Let's start by confessing our wrongdoing. Just between you and God, right now, right where you're standing. No, no, the Holy Spirit told me to do something different. If, you, if you're here and you got sin in your life, I'm not going to pick on you, I'm not going to embarrass you. But I'm telling you, you need to make a move toward God. I want you to come down out of the balcony, come out of the seats, come running down front. It doesn't matter if it's a little one or a big one, a white one or a black one. It doesn't matter if it's a long-term one or one from yesterday. Come on, let's allow the Spirit of God to deal with our lives. Let's be set free. Come right now. Anyone and everyone, if you've got sin in your life, if, you, if you're not a Christian, come right now. Come on, clap louder. People need this. People need this. Come right now. Come right now. I'm not going to embarrass you. You're not going to have to talk on a microphone. We're not, we, don't, we don't care what it was. Everybody say, we don't care. Everybody say, we don't care. I did mention that gossip was wrong. It's, yeah, yeah. We don't care what's wrong. Come on, keep on clapping. They're still coming. We don't care. Please. We don't care about knowing what you did or what you've been doing. We care about you. We care about you. Jesus cares about you. The Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit that's in the earth cares about you. It won't do us any good to say, well, that's not so bad. No, it is bad. It's a killer. It won't do us any good to say, oh, well, you know, everybody's got some sin. No, everybody doesn't. Not everybody has present sin in their life. They just don't. People make mistakes, yeah. But not everybody, not everybody is practicing ongoing, continual sin. They're not. That's a lie. It's not just not right. Let's just bow our heads. I'm so proud of these people coming here. Humble, humble, open-hearted. Wow, what an impressive thing. Because I promise you guys, there's some people still in their seats back there that should have come down here. But you have made a move toward God. You've made a move toward reality and truth. And you've made a, a move toward rescue. I want you to pray this prayer. Just bow your head, humble your heart. Just say it very simply. Lord Jesus, I am sorry. I have sinned and I'm sorry. And I repent. I turn from it. I change my mind about it. It's not my friend. It's not just a slip up. I have chosen to sin and my sin is ugly and it offends you, and it hurts you, and it'll kill me, and I need you to rescue me right now. Cleanse my sin. Wash me in the blood of Christ Jesus, and deliver me. Set me free from it. That's my desire in the name of Jesus, and I open my heart to your Holy Spirit to defeat Satan in my life. Thank you, Lord, for forgiving me. Amen. Amen. Thank you. In the name of Jesus, I come against every demonic spirit of deception and delusion and bondage and slavery. I command every demonic spirit that's been holding these people in the grip of some sin, I command you, loose them and let them go. Come out of their lives. I drive you out in that matchless name above every name, the name of Jesus Christ and His authority. I drive you out of their lives. I drive out those demonic spirits that have been holding them in bondage now in Jesus' name. 
Christ of Nazareth's name. In Jesus' name, be made free. Somebody give the Lord a hand clap. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Who are my, has anybody come, just first time you've ever accepted Jesus as your Savior, the first time you ever committed to Him, just let me see if, if I got somebody like that. Anybody? First timer. First time to get saved. All right, thank you. I'll let y'all go back to your seats. Is there anybody in the audience this morning who'll say, I, I just need to become a Christian. I need to escape sin. Put your hand up real high. Just real high. I'm not going to embarrass you. I just want to know if you're here. Anyone up in the balcony? Anyone all over the room? Mostly Christian people. How many of you know Christian people need to get a hold of this? Amen. Hey, I love you. Anybody still love me? Good. Nice. Nice. You know, you know, it's a sin and it's wrong to be mad at your preacher for bringing this stuff up. Come on, put your hands together for our pastor. What? Come on, put those hands together. Aren't you glad we've got a bold preaching pastor? Amen and amen.